ESPN Sports Radio 1392.5. Now for something completely different. We're going to bring, bring it all together. Come the bottom line. Bottom line. Bottom line. ESPN Radio 1392.5. It's the bottom line with Brad Taylor, presented by Stable Duel. Sports talk from a handicapping perspective. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on this first Saturday in May. I'm sure you all know what that means. Miss Judy, please take your meds this morning or I will make sure you get shut out from all derby wagering today. And I know you have big bets on the line. 859-381-1313. If you'd like to call in and join in on the conversation, you can follow us on Twitter at Bottom Line Lex, and you can email the show anytime. Bottom line Lex at gmail.com. On today's show, another cavalcade of stars to get you ready for the day's big race, the Kentucky Derby, a race you can hear later today on our sister station, Hank 96.1. First up, it'll be Brian Howard of Stable Duel will join us, and he will tell us what they've got going on at Stable Duel today, and he will give us his derby picks for today because apparently a lot of people have been bothering him all week, but he'll get it out once and for all here on the bottom line. Then our friend Vince Stover of the Sports Stove Podcast will join us. He will recap the NFL draft with us, talk some Major League Baseball and all kinds of other stuff. Maybe he'll throw in a couple of UFC picks. And then our nemesis and bitter rival here at LM Communications, then our Dennis Dillon of our sister station, Classic Rock 92.1. He'll stop by to gloat over his incredible run during the Keeneland meet and then give his derby picks as well. And, of course, the most profitable segment in Lexington Radio, our Mac Daddy Stogie Picks, presented by Jake Cigar Bar. All that and much, much more coming up on this week's Saturday edition of Lexington's fastest-growing sports talk radio show. But first, 30 years. A lot can happen in 30 years. Not just in sports, but in life. I remember where I was 30 years ago. Well, kind of remember where I was. I just moved to Atlanta. Times were a lot different then than they are now. But 30 years ago, the Cincinnati Bengals won a playoff game against the Houston Oilers. That shows you how long ago that was. The Houston Oilers. They're not, they don't even exist anymore. They're now the Tennessee Titans. Coach of that team was Jerry Glanville. A few months later, he'd be headed to Atlanta himself. So you'd think, oh, wow, the Bengals, they must have beat Warren Moon. No, they didn't beat Warren Moon that day. They beat Cody Carlson at quarterback for the Oilers that day. And the Bengals blew them out of the water, 41-13. But that was the last time the Bengals won an NFL playoff game, the longest drought in the NFL. Since that time, the Bengals have made the playoffs seven times, and they've lost all seven. In fact, they were favored to win four of those seven games out in the desert over the years. So the Bengals have been horrible in the playoffs in the rare seasons that they've made the playoffs. In contrast, there's another franchise in the NFL that's made the playoffs 21 times in the last 30 years, including winning 23 playoff games in the process and two Super Bowls. Wow, they must have great leadership, great ownership, great general manager, great draft picks, all much better than the Bengals, right? Well, not so much. That team, the Green Bay Packers. In the last 30 years, you could argue that the Bengals' first-round draft picks have been better than the Packers. Oh, that's crazy talk. What do you got here? Well, let's look at the Packers' first-round picks over the last 30 years. Okay, Aaron Rodgers, I'll give you that one. Clay Matthews, okay, I'll give you that one. But listen to some of these other guys. The best picks other than those two, Vonnie Holiday, Terrell Buckley, Nick Barnett, A.J. Hawk, those are your best draft picks in the last 30 years. Let's look at this list of swings and misses. We won't count Jordan Love from last year, but who are these guys? John Michaels, Justin Harrell, Jamal Reynolds, Derek Sherrod, Daryl Thompson. All guys who were terrible in their first-round picks. These guys were out of the league in less than four years. So you sit there and look, well, how are the, how are the Packers so good? Let's look at the Bengals' first-round draft picks. Yeah, they hit some big ones. Carson Palmer. Willie Anderson, Justin Smith, all great players, all multi-time pro bowlers. Of course, Justin Smith, most of those were away from Cincinnati. Takeo Spikes, Daryl Williams, 
Even Big Daddy Dan Wilkinson had a couple good years outside of Cincinnati. So the players that the Bengals have picked have actually been better than the Packers. So how are the Bengals so bad? Why are they so terrible every year? And why do the Packers consistently make the playoffs and win a couple of Super Bowls while the Bengals can't even win a playoff game in 30 years? Look at these multiple pro pro bowlers. The Bengals have drafted seven multiple pro bowlers in the last 30 years. The Packers only drafted two. What's the difference? Why is Green Bay so much better than Cincinnati? You could say ownership. You could say culture. It's two reasons. It's Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. You ever hear of a kid being talked about being spoiled, rotten? Sometimes my grandmother, when I was a kid, talked about me being spoiled, rotten, but she'd always say I was spolt, S-P-O-L-T. Big difference. Well, the NFL draft lived up to expectations this week when the Bengals probably should have picked an offensive lineman but took a wide receiver. Of course, the Niners, once again, shocked the world by not letting anyone know who they were going to pick until the last minute when they took Trey Lance with the overall third pick. And if you listened to us last Sunday on this show, we totally cleaned up on the draft out in the desert. We were very happy with how things turned out. That's why the desert literally hates posting these odds on these props because if a schlep like me can sit here and do some research and figure out a few things, so can anyone else. You go back and listen to our podcast of last Sunday's show, WLXG.com. You can hear us talk about those winning props. So we were very happy with how things turned out. But the betting markets figured things out before it happened. Three weeks ago, Justin Fields was favored to go third. And then two weeks ago, it was Mac Jones. But by the time the draft started and Kings of Leon were still playing in concert, Lord knows they played too long, Trey Lance was the heavy favorite to be the third overall pick. So the public money had it. Unlike any other sport where you have to handicap results, the public is on these that have to do with just people thinking. Big difference. Yet another reason why the books out in the desert hate posting action on the NFL draft. In fact, the state of Nevada and some other states as well have taken their lead. Nevada takes these props off the board 24 hours before the draft because the late action is just too easy to predict And it's okay to play these big favorites in the draft because so many of them hit. But the biggest newsmaker of this draft day wasn't even a draft pick. It was the Packers apparently preparing to trade Aaron Rodgers. The Packers are an amazing franchise in this league. They were the team of the 60s before most of us watched football. You've seen all those old NFL films clips with the ice bowl. And it was 15 below zero. And John Facenda using that voice talking about Vince Lombardi, you know, with that deep voice like he had. Well, I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. The Packers were terrible. Not many people can name a bunch of players from the Packers during the 70s and 80s because they were most of them were just terrible. But in 1991, the Packers traded for a, a, they traded a first round draft pick to Atlanta for Brett Favre, who the year before had been a second-round draft pick. I remember Brett Favre, not as a Packer, but as a Falcon. See, I was in Atlanta in 1991. And when Favre was sitting on the bench with the Falcons, it was a tough time for him. He was supposed to be the backup quarterback to start the season, but he was so terrible that he was demoted to third string for a guy they just signed off the street named Billy Joe Tolliver, who eventually uh, people in Atlanta called him Billy Joe Overthrow. But Favre was miserable in Atlanta. He earned that nickname, Buckhead Brett, because every night he was out in this little party district of Atlanta called Buckhead, just living it up. Even the few times I went out with my friends, sorry, Mom, I went out, we saw him. True story. In fact, Favre partied so much that he missed the team photo one day because he was hungover. And, of course, Atlanta coach Jerry Glanville hated Favre because the general manager that drafted him outranked him on the choice because Glanville, in his genius, wanted to pick Browning Nagel from Louisville instead. So when the Packers general manager, Ron Wolf called Atlanta after Favre's rookie season, where he made four passes, two of them were incomplete, the other two were intercepted, and they offered a first-rounder for Favre, legend has it that the Falcons general manager, Ken Harrock, put the Packers on hold while he laughed at them. And then Harrock called in Jerry Glanville, I told him about the offer, and then they both laughed. 
The rest is history. The Packers general manager, Ron Wolf, he's now in the Hall of Fame. Jerry Glanville was last seen leaving tickets for Elvis in the XFL as a defensive coordinator. But the Packers are spoiled rotten because they have had something that no other franchise has ever had, a Hall of Fame quarterback for three decades in a row. Between Favre starting in 1992 with the Packers and today with Aaron Rodgers, no team in history has had the quarterback run that the Packers have. And still, they have only two Super Bowls to show for it. So if you're the Packers fan today, and you've had the good life for 30 years, is losing Aaron Rodgers a big deal? Oh, yeah. Because you haven't had to be a common team with an average quarterback since Magic Man Don Mikowski in 1991. Good times. The NFL draft continues today, but without the fanfare of the first round, which was borderline unwatchable with the concerts of the Lazy Boy chairs and the fans who are obviously being forced to cheer. I miss the old days when it was on Tuesday morning in New York City when there was only a few New York Giants and Jets fans and Eagles fans there, and the players were booed, not just the commissioner. Good times. It just seemed too much like it's forced down our throats right now. But 30 years is a long time. A long run of success in a league where parity rules like the NFL. It just goes to show how important the quarterback position is. And when you're the Bengals and you don't have a quarterback, you don't have a Hall of Fame quarterback, the best thing you had was Carson Palmer. He's the best draft po- choice you've made in those 30 years. And you still couldn't win because he was at Hall of Fame level like Favre and Aaron Rodgers. The Packers have drafted horribly for years. Yet they keep competing, unlike the Bengals. Why? Two guys. Two Hall of Fame quarterbacks. No team has had two quarterbacks like this for 30 years. The 49ers had one for 20 years. Steve Young following Joe Montana. I'll go to my grave saying Steve Young was better than Joe Montana. Look at the numbers. Just I know Montana won, Joe Cool. Steve Young was a better player. He was a better quarterback. Just ask, when we get to the other side, just ask Bill Walsh. I guarantee he'll tell you the same thing. There's a story about Bill Walsh in 1986, gathering all his coaches into an office. And keep in mind, there were some big names on that coaching staff. Mike Holmgren, George Seifert, Dennis Green, Ray Rhodes, all guys who went on to coach playoff teams somewhere else on their own. And Bill Walsh told all his staff and asked them, should we trade a second rounder and a fourth rounder to Tampa Bay for Steve Young? And they all said no. Nobody raised their hand. And Bill Walsh, being himself, said, well, too bad, because I just did. I wanted to see what you thought. He's already on a flight here, and we're, he's being picked up at the airport right now as we speak. The Niners went from Montana to Young, and they had two decades of Hall of Fame quarterbacks, and they still then they got five Super Bowls out of that, although the Packers only got two. So when you hear about Aaron Rodgers potentially being traded or even hosted Jeopardy, because he's as good as anyone that I've seen hosting Jeopardy, not named Ken Jennings. That's another story altogether. Especially that overhyped Anderson Cooper, who was just too slow to react to the answers. I digress. Aaron Rodgers being traded is a huge story. And over half the teams in the league should try to get him at any cost. Because he, along with Brett Favre, spoiled their fan base like no other for the past 30 years especially with franchises like the Bengals, who unarguably drafted better than the Packers did over the last 30 years, couldn't even come close to matching them on the field because while the Packers had Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre, the Bengals were drafting guys like David Klingler and Achilles Smith. And that's the bottom line. ESPN Radio 1,392.5. The bottom line with Brad Taylor, presented by Stable Duel. Sports talk from a handicapping perspective. Your Cincinnati Reds win last night over the Chicago Cubs 8-6. Now sitting 12-13 on the season. Three and a half games behind the Brewers in the playoffs. The good news for the Reds is they finally maybe have found a closer. TJ Antone came in at the end of the game after Lucas Sims was brought in to close it and proceeded to walk three guys as only he he can. Nice call again by David Bell. That bullpen of comedy of errors continues. But TJ Antone... I have, for my money, he's your best pitcher, your best closer for sure. 14 innings, 0.64 ERA. ERA plus 707 with 20 strikeouts and 14 innings. Why isn't he closing? Oh, yes. Bell is loyal to Sims and Garrett, Amir Garrett, for some reason. 
It's not like they've proven themselves over the past few years, but they put these, they're putting these spots because basically nobody else on the team could do it other than Sean Doolittle, who was signed in March when 29 other teams passed on him. Well, after last night, Antone should be closing out games. If he's not, that's on David Bell. Last night was the first game after a six-game road trip that ended 2-4. and four. Most of the people see that road trip as a success due to the fact they beat the Dodgers, the best team in baseball, two out of three. Never mind the fact that they were swept over the weekend in St. Louis, but hey, they got two out of three in L.A., so who cares, right? Well, I'd much rather have two out of three against the Cardinals than I would two out of three against the Dodgers. But if you want to talk about guys who have proven it and that may deserve benefit of the doubt, it's a Eugenio Suarez, who quite possibly could be the worst player in all of Major League Baseball for the month of April. That's not opinion, that's the numbers. After one month, Suarez 12 for 92 on the season. 130 batting average. Oh, by the way, 40 strikeouts. And that's after him having a huge night, for him anyway, a one for four night with a home run. But he's proven in the past that he's been a productive player. Although he's done that, how long can you keep this guy batting third and fourth in your lineup every night? I don't think you have a choice but to move him down until he gets straightened out, if he ever does. But our old friend Joey Votto... Finally starting to heat up. Three hits last night. 242 average now. 300th career home run for, in our opinion, a future Hall of Famer. That's another topic for another day, though. Votto isn't doing something this year that has made him successful in the past. He doesn't take walks anymore. This year, Votto has nine walks on the season for a guy who has drawn over 100 walks in six seasons in his career and over 90 walks in two other seasons. That's why he has one of the best on-base percentage numbers in the history of Major League Baseball, but that number is fading fast in recent years, mainly because he doesn't take walks anymore. And when you get away from what makes you different from everyone else, that's when things change. What made Votto different and a Hall of Famer was that he took walks and led the league in on-base percentage seven times. Seven times he led the league in OBP. Three years ago, his on-base percentage was 417. Now, it's 308. You do the math. He doesn't get on base anymore. But the best player for the Reds have this season has been Jesse Winker, no question. Leads the NL in hits, third in uh, OPS, eighth in war. Oh, by the way, he missed five games of the Reds' 25 this season. The only problem is he hits leadoff most of the year, and Winker has the speed of a man running with a piano on his back. Regardless, most offensive success the Reds have had this season is due to Winker more than anyone else. But today, 340 here on ESPN Radio, 1,392.5, game two of Cubs and Reds from Great American Ballpark. Zach Davies for the Cubs, one and two, 9.47 ERA. I guess Luis Castillo for the Reds, one and two, 6.29 ERA. Not exactly Jacob deGrom versus Garrett Cole today. Zach Davies hasn't been good all year, but he's been a better than average pitcher throughout his career. Career ERA 3.94 in over 700 innings. Career ERA plus 109, where the average pitcher is 100. And he's been very good in the desert throughout his career. Davies spent most of his career in Milwaukee, and his teams are 72 and 56 in his 128 career starts. That's 56.3%. And if you've invested $1 every time Zach Davies has started in his life, you'd be up $18.13. That's pretty good. It's really good. But in his career, Davies 7-6 against the Reds, including 1-3 at Great American Ballpark. But, of course, those numbers are with other teams, not the Cubs that he's with today. Luis Castillo struggling all season. Career ERA before this season, 3.62 ERA plus 126. But this year, 6.29 ERA and an ERA plus of 72. As we detailed last week, it's not pretty for him in the desert either. Reds now 46-49 and 49 when Castillo starts. And if you blindly put a dollar on him every time he started in his life, you're down seven ninety five. That's not good. At home, Castillo is a little better, twenty six and twenty three, three and three lifetime against the Cubs. Personally, my numbers today say the Reds should be about a buck and a quarter, dollar twenty five favorite. But the line, basically due to the name Castillo sitting uh, next to the Reds, says Reds minus one sixty. That's way too much. The Cubs have the uh, better value today if you're so inclined. Let's get to our Mac Daddy Stogie picks really quick, presented by Jake Cigar Bar. 
How do you celebrate picking a winner? Head on down to Jake's Cigar Bar at Brandon Crossing and light up that back daddy stogie even before the game ends. Light it up and uh, celebrate as they say down there. Smoke local, drink local, and cross the line with us at Jake's Cigar Bar. Check them out at Brandon Crossing. Go online, jakescigarbar.com. Our baseball play for today, the Dodgers, minus 130 against the Brewers. Brewers an underdog. May versus Woodruff. Uh, Dustin May, a good pitcher. Brandon Woodruff, a really good pitcher. I think you're getting the better team in the better spot today. Whose bullpen do you like better, Brewers or Dodgers? If you've looked at them, it's an easy call. I'll take Josh Hader, even though he pitched last night. I'll take Josh Hader in the bullpen. I've got the better starter, the better bullpen. I've got the home field. Yeah. Why am I an underdog? I don't know. Mainly because the other team's name is the Los Angeles Dodgers. Name recognition, a huge thing in tonight's game. We think we'll take Brandon Woodruff and the Dodgers, excuse me, and the Brewers tonight as home dogs against the Dodgers. By the way, the Brewers are a better team. They're, ten, they're 16 and 10 on the year. Dodgers 16 and 11. How are the Dodgers favored in this one? I'm getting a lot of value with the Brewers. We'll take the Brewers tonight. Brandon Woodruff, give us them as a home dog against the Dodgers. That's our Mac Daddy Stogie of the week, or the day, excuse me, brought to you by Jake Cigar Bar. And if you're so inclined, go on the under in that one. It totals eight. Kind of like that one to go under. Spring a little pizza money on that one, if you know what I mean. But coming up uh, this afternoon is the Derby, Kentucky Derby. Last week, we had Keith Farmer on our show. He gave us three for your, uh, for your uh, trifecta. Hidden Stash sitting right now at 39 to 1. Superstock 46 to 1. Known Agenda 16 to 1. He liked uh, Keith Farmer, who's uh, broadcasting live from the Derby today. So he's got the inside scoop, allegedly. We know him. So he's, uh, he's a gambler like the rest of us. Yeah, those three guys for your, uh, for your trifecta. And of course, our official bottom line horse racing expert, Peyron Harris of Richmond, Kentucky. He gave us a whole big list of people to take. He's big on essential quality, number 14 today. He says Wheelam with uh, number one, known agenda, seven, Mandaloon, and 15, Rock Your World. Superfecta box, one, seven, 14, 15, those four we just mentioned. If you missed some of these derby picks, uh, Peyron has been doing this for a long time, and he's got it. He also says take the 14 over the one, over the seven, over the 15. If you need any questions with this, just go check our podcast, WLXG.com, if you missed some of those. But uh, I'll listen to my good friend, Peyron Harris from Richmond, our official horse racing expert here on the bottom line. But coming up after the break, we're going to talk with Brian Howard of Stable Duel. He's going to give us the Stable Duel angle on things. And people have been bugging him all week about getting his derby picks. So we're going to get it from him once and for all. That's coming up next right here on ESPN Radio 1300 and 92.5. 92.5. It is Kentucky Derby Day. And with us now is our good friend, Brian Howard from Stable Duel. Brian, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great. What a day it's going to be. He's already happy, but he's already getting his, uh, it's only 8, 9.30 in the morning here, Brian, and you need to slow it down now. Races it for another eight hours, I think, something like that. Nine hours, I think. So you need to just calm well, yourself, pace yourself the rest of the day now, okay? No, false. The races start in one hour, oh, so okay. I'm going the whole card today. So uh, it's not a one-race thing for me. It's a, mar- it's a marathon, not a sprint for Brian Howard at Stable Duel. <laughs> what do you guys going, got going on over there today, buddy? Uh, we actually have all of our games are, fo- are Santa Anita focused today. Um, you know, we've got a free game, a ten dollar game, and a thousand dollar game. So we've got a little something for everybody. So anybody that hasn't tried Stable Duel that's heard me on here that wants to, today's the day. It's a free game, no risk to you. Sign up, play, win real money. We don't give away coins or points like other sites. We give away real money in our free games. Yeah, it's, I played every day of the Keeneland meet, and uh, it was it was great. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Cast a couple times. Wished I could have cast a few more, but hey, I'm not. Uh, I don't cheat around here like Dead Air Dennis does. Hey, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's get your picks for the Derby today. I know a lot of people have been bugging you. You had to go out on social media this week and tell people to stop bothering you for your Derby <laughs> picks. So you're laughing because you know I'm right. But today, you're actually going to announce it so people will leave you alone. So, Brian Howard of Stable Duel, tell us your derby picks for today. Okay, well, let, let's start off. I want to touch on something because I know a lot of your uh, fan base is, is are gamblers and, and Amen. like yes. to play all kinds of stuff. So, so one thing I want to touch on today that a lot of people may not pick up on is a lot of the graded stake races or all the graded stake races today are run without Lasix. So it's not going to really affect the Derby that much as most of these two-year-olds came up in rules that didn't allow Lasix for them. Um, Lasix is a diuretic that 
that keeps them from bleeding in a race, for those that don't know. So some of these older horses um, in these races before the Derby have run on Lasix their entire career and are starting to enter these stake races where they are not having Lasix and they don't run near as well. So it's something to keep an eye on today. Um, there's a couple horses that stand out as complete tosses for me. But as far as my picks goes, I'm actually going to give you a, a little bit of a pick three here. I'm going to start in the 10th race and give you a little bit of a price on the three-horse basin. It's going to be ridden by Jose Ortiz. Uh, he won last out without Lasix. This is one of those races I'm talking about where where I think the Lasix issue becomes a big, big issue. And this horse proved it can run without the Lasix. Some of these horses that are favored have not proven that. So I'm going with that, and you're getting eight to one on the morning line on that. So in the 11th race, we've got the Old Forester Bourbon Turf Classic. It's a mile and an eighth on the grass. This was uh, this used to be an automatic fill-in for Wise Dan when he was back running, if you remember him. But uh, this year, I've got also I've got the three horse Todd Pletcher, Irad Ortiz on Colonel Liam. Uh, this horse is one of the best turf horses in the country. Uh, his form fits. He's going to come from just off the pace. And, and blow by everybody in the stretch. If you're playing any pick threes, pick fours, pick fives, however you do it, I think Colonel Liam's a single in, in those to save you a little bit of cash. And then the main event. This is the one that everybody wants to know. I've been kind of back and forth. I'm actually kind of waffling on my earlier selection. Uh, now watching the track and how it played yesterday, and it didn't favor any front speed. So... I'm going to stick with it for your show because I think this is the best horse, and I think this horse is the one that's going to get the best trip because it's going to create his own trip. And I'm going with Rock Your World, which I believe is the 15? Yes. Yes, 15 with Joel Rosario on. You know, the Derby is the hardest race to handicap in the world. I mean, there's 20 horses. They all are good. Um Every, you can make a case for why every one of them can win. You can make a case for why all of them will lose. Uh, but it comes down to trip. And in the Derby, I want the horse that I know is going to get the best trip. Well, if I'm out on the front, you can't get any better trip than that because I'm going to create my own and hope that these other horses that may be a touch better than this horse, they may not get the perfect trip and may not be able to catch this horse in the stretch. So I'm looking for him to jump out of the gate early, kind of rest that second quarter a little bit and have an extra gear in the stretch and roll home at a decent price. That's what we like on this show, Brian Howard. Don't just give us your picks. Give us reasons behind your picks. Do a little bit of research, have a little bit of uh, you know homework done, and then give us your reasoning along with your picks. And you did that. That was great. In the 10th race, number three, Basin. In 11th race, number three, Colonel Liam. And in the Derby today, Brian Howard from Stable Duel likes number 15, Rock Your World, right now sitting at 9-2 to two on the morning line. Brian Howard, as always, we wish you the best of luck and on this show, as always. May the winners be yours, my friend. Thanks. Let's, let's go get that money today. Amen, buddy. Let's cash some tickets. We'll talk to you soon, buddy. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. That's Brian Howard from Stable Duel. Coming up after the break is Vince Stover from the Hot Stove, excuse me, the, the Sports Stove Podcast. Coming up next right here on ESPN Radio 1300 and 92.5. ESPN Radio 1300, 92.5. I the tiger, baby. If you can't try to cash some tickets on Derby Day, the pilot line is out. Here comes Rocky and Mr. T to the ring. And speaking of overrated boxers, our next guest, Vince Stover of the Sports Stove Podcast. Vince, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing awesome. <laughs> you remember Rocky Three? Rocky Three is eighty two, I think. A little before your time, right? Oh yeah, I've seen all the Rockies though. I like I like every single one of them. You, even Rocky Five? All of them. Nobody Even likes Rocky Five. Point. That's terrible. Okay. <laughs> uh, you got a bone to pick with me on this Packers monologue I just started the show with here. What's up with that? Well, it, it's so much bigger than, than uh, you know, what you covered, the first round draft picks and stuff like that. I mean, you look at Green Bay and Cincinnati and you, com- you want to compare them. I don't think there's very much comparison at all. Uh, I mean, you look at coaching over the years. Um, you know, Martin Lewis was there for a while, but I think McCarthy was better than him. You look at late round draft picks, Green Bay dominated second round, third round, fourth round picks. Um, they had guys on the O line, receivers, uh, stud players on running backs, all of that coming from late round draft picks. 
Um, so you can miss on the first as long as you hit on two through seven. And then I think the other thing is the division. Green Bay has played in a weak division uh, for the most part over the years. Cincinnati's division has been pretty tough when you include Pittsburgh and then in more recent years, Baltimore. Yeah, but don't quarterbacks like Favre and Rodgers, don't, aren't they the deodorant that covers up all the stink? I mean, come on. Let's just, what do the Packers have right now? I mean, they don't have stars all around that team. They've got Aaron Rodgers, and they're just, you know, it just seems like eh, he's carrying them as far as he can. Well, no, see, that's the misconception. The oh. quarterback is the most important position for sure. And if you miss on quarterback, it, it's not going to be pretty. Um, there's no doubt right. about that. But the Packers, listen, they were in 13-3 and three two straight years. It's not because all they had was Aaron Rodgers. They've got phenomenal running backs, Aaron Jones leading the way. They have one of the top offensive lines in the league. Uh, they have a decent defense that once they fired their defensive coordinator uh, a year or so ago, or uh, now, no, actually this past year, it's only going to get better. But they, they, they're not a bad team. <laughs> they're, they're, Aaron Rodgers is great, yes. But just because they haven't drafted a first-round wide receiver doesn't mean that they're a bad team. Like I said, offensive line top in the league. That cannot go unnoticed. That's important because that's why Aaron Jones is a great running back. And then you add Devontae Adams as a wide receiver. He is one of the top four, top five in the league right now as well. Um, you know, And the Packers system, as much as you know, we talk about system quarterbacks, Rodgers is not a system quarterback. But the system that he's played in under Mike McCarthy for a long time until it went stale, and now uh, they, their system now is just it opens the opportunities on offense as well. Um, I think coaching and play calling is one of the bigger impacts along with those drafts that you get those, those fourth through seventh round offensive linemen that turn into be all-stars. All good points, and I, it's impossible to disagree with any of them. But I'm sorry, when you trade for Favre and draft Aaron Rodgers, it's a lot better than if you draft David Klingler and Achilles <laughs> Smith. That is the big thing. that I, that is, That's one thing that I'm looking at. So we'll agree to disagree on that one. We'll call that one a draw for now. And they're similar with how they run quarterbacks out, right? Uh, Carson Palmer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Absolutely true, yeah. yes. Let's get to this year's draft. Enough silliness. Your thoughts on this one. I know you did a lot of mock drafts on your podcast. Your thoughts on the surprises. Was it Trey Lance going three? Mac Jones falling to 15 of the Patriots. Your thoughts on the first round of this NFL draft? So the first 15 picks weren't super surprising. Um, you know, my mock draft, I actually I got 10 correct on it, which I was pretty proud of. The, uh, the ESPN guys got less than that. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> you know, I had said from the get-go, from the trade with San Francisco when they moved up to, to three, I said there's no way they're drafting Mac Jones. Now, when I did my mock draft, I fell for it. I went through the smoke. And I said, you know, everybody's saying it, so it must be true. So I, but I said Trey Lance leading all the way up to two hours before I did my mock draft on the podcast and eventually switched it to Mac Jones. Um, so that one I missed at the end of the day. But the first, you know, I got six out of the first seven picks correct. Then you, you flow down through, you get defensive players start coming into the draft. Um, Trey Lance, I mean, listen, I think Trey Lance is the right pick for San Francisco. They've got Garoppolo there. They can let Lance sit for a year do the whole Alex Smith, Patrick Mahomes thing, and I think he could turn out really well for San Francisco. Um, but you got Mac Jones dropping to 15. I mean, at, after really pick three, the question was, where do the other quarterbacks go? And uh, with, with Denver showing that they weren't going to go quarterback uh, in signing Teddy Bridgewater or trading for Teddy Bridgewater, you had to start wondering, well, somebody's going to have to trade up. And so Chicago trades up to get the one in field. And then after that, you're sitting there going, well, what's going to happen next? A lot of smoke about the Saints coming up for Mac Jones. They never move. And New England just sits pretty. And, I mean, they've got three picks so far. And it's been, uh, I mean, it's just it's so New England. They're just getting the guys that everybody else probably should have drafted. I stopped watching the draft live after Mac Jones got drafted because I saw him walk in. I saw him walk <laughs> on the stage. And I'm like, yeah. oh, he is a Patriot through and through. That guy's going to be yeah. a perfect fit. He walked just like Belichick, <laughs> ignoring all the fans while they're throwing stuff at him. So, yeah, these quarterbacks first round, it, you know, it's you sit here and you say, how can, you know, a guy like Zach Wilson, why were the Jets just so convinced with them? You know, I understand the Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence. You could not pass him as a first pick. But the rest right. of these guys, and then you look at a, guy, a team like Atlanta, why wouldn't you want to get a quarterback to – 
get ready for Matt Ryan because, I mean, he's 36 now, and, yeah, he's still putting up good numbers. But eventually, I mean, the Packers, your team, they went after Jordan Love last year. Yeah, um, when you come to Atlanta, it's job security because the guys drafting and coaching, they're not guaranteed to be there for 10 years, and they have to win now. And Matt Ryan can still win now. Matt Ryan's a really, really good quarterback. And, I mean, he's above average in this league. And so you've got him. Now you add Kyle Pitts, who's dynamic. You've got, you've got an offense right now. They, they need running back help. But you've got an offense right now that can compete in that division. And that's a tough division with Tampa returning everybody. Carolina's getting better. New Orleans is a little bit in question with their quarterback situation. And they've got kind of a depleted talent level as well on offense. But, you know, Atlanta's got to win now. They've got to make the playoffs. And in order to do that, you're going to have to add guys that can help you this year. Now, I think Justin Fields was the second-best quarterback in the draft. Um, I would have been okay if Atlanta took him there. But I also understand, you know, Arthur Smith, the head coach, and the new general manager, they've got to do what's best for their team in the next year and two years to make sure that they can compete and not get fired after three years. The Bengals. I was in the, I was in the Penny Sewell camp, but they went with Jamar Chase. Right or wrong pick, in your opinion? I think it's the right pick. I was Jamar Chase the entire way. Um, and, you know, for me, there's if you look in free agency, if you look in other areas around town, uh, you'll see that there's there's just options at offensive line. And, uh, you know, they picked up Jackson Carmen in the second round. He's a guard from Clemson. We played tackle at Clemson, but he'll play guard in Cincinnati. Um, he's a good run run blocker, and he'll be a good fit in there. Jamar Chase just adds so much to the offense. And you're talking about long-term, too. T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, uh, Tyler Boyd all in there on the offense. That's dynamic, and you need that in today's, in today's NFL. Yes, you got to protect the quarterback, but I think they did the right thing. Uh, Jackson Carmen in the second round. They've got three picks coming up in the fourth round today, and there are some really solid uh, offensive linemen still available. Trey Smith probably being the top of them as a guard. So, you know, the Bengals still have opportunities to improve the offensive line. But for me, Jamar Chase was just the best option for them sitting there at number five as opposed to a Pene Sewell. Um, Because on the offensive line, Brad, you need five offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. Like, you've got to have them. One offensive lineman is not going to make or break you. You've got to have five of them. And so I like Jamar Chase there at five. And the argument is, well, you know, if Jamar Chase can get open, it takes three seconds. But what if he, you know, you don't have three seconds of time because your <laughs> offensive line is getting run over? Well, you can sit here and debate that. I was, I was with the Sewell camp, but I mean, you know, it's not like Chase was is going to be a bust for right now. But I mean, I just right. thought you had to protect your investment. A couple of Kentucky guys go: Kelvin Joseph to the Cowboys, Jamin Davis. Your thoughts on those guys? And Dallas desperately needed cornerbacks. Mm-hmm. They ended up drafting two of them: Kelvin Joseph first. I'm not a Kelvin Joseph guy. Um, to me, he's too inconsistent. He's got great size, um, and he's, he's got some great highlights as well. But, you know, to me, there's so much inconsistency with him. So if they can develop him, maybe it works out. Uh, I was surprised they didn't. Well, there wasn't a cornerback for him in, in round one uh, to go for us. They went right before Dallas at, at where they were sitting at 10. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I'm not huge on that one for Dallas or for Kelvin Joseph. He'll get plenty of playing time there. Jamin Davis to Washington, I love. I had him mocked uh, to Washington as well. And uh, so I think it's a great fit. He's, you know, I'm not a huge Jamin Davis guy, but his athleticism is great. And you go to a team that has a stacked defense in Washington, it's a, it's a great fit for him. It's going to really put him in a prime opportunity uh, to play. And then you've got today, rounds four through seven, you've got probably three or four more Kentucky guys that can go with Drake Jackson, Landon Young, Quentin Bohannon, Brandon Eccles, and then you got the punter, Max Duffy. Maybe he gets drafted, more than likely gets signed after the draft. You also got a uh, defensive-minded coach out there in Washington, too. Yeah, the Kelvin yeah. Joseph one, the Dallas felt like they just, you know, they had their mind set on to take a corner, and then when they went 8-9 right in front of them, it's like, ah, oh, we give up. We're just going to, you just, you know, <laughs> they, you know, they just gave away a pick to their division rival. It's like, we, we don't care. Just take over. We don't know what to do. Just you know, it was yeah, almost Kel- like saving face, yeah. And Kelvin Joseph's going to have to cover 
the guy that Philadelphia traded up to take. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Expectations. You got to. He's got to have first round expectations on that second round pick. Yeah. Uh, so, in other words, you said that today uh, you've got a lot of Kentucky guys going. Uh, in other words, uh, the winners and losers of the draft so far. You know, you hate to do this at this point, but I mean, you're winners and losers. Man, I love what Miami's done in the draft. They get uh, Jalen Waddle at six, Jalen Phillips in the first round as well. They bring in the safety Holland from Oregon, who's great. Eisenberg, an offensive lineman from Notre Dame, who I think was was top four, and then Hunter Long a tight end. Miami's just gotten better and better and better, and then uh, the rich get richer. Kansas City. Had two picks yesterday over the last two days. Nick Bolton and Creed Humphrey um, make their team better. And uh, so I think Kansas City, New England, and Chicago, as much as I hate it as a Packer fan, man, they traded up and got Justin Fields. That was a great move for Chicago. They also had Tevin Jenkins, one of the top O-line uh, in the draft. They got him in the second round as he fell. Um, so Chicago, Miami, Kansas City, New England, my goodness, they got Mac Jones, their quarterback of the future, far more the top defensive lineman in the draft. And then Ronnie Perkins, one of the top edge rushers in the draft also. So, I mean, Kansas City and New England just continue to build. The Jets I like to, but uh, I'm not completely sold on Wilson at quarterback, but I like what they did as far as getting the quarterback. They like offensive line help and wide receiver help in, in the first two days. Kansas City 5-1 to one to win the Super Bowl. Are you, th- are you telling me to take that? Is that what you're saying? They are legit. I mean, they you know they're super talented. Anyhow, before the draft, their offensive line they've got seven starters for their offensive line. You can only start five of them. They got seven of them. So if they have injuries or things like that happen, they'll be able to fill that in. Protecting Patrick Mahomes is everything, and uh, this defense is getting better as well. So yeah, I, I right now I've got Kansas City over Tampa Bay. Vince Stover from the Sports Stove Podcast. Give us your uh, UFC picks for tonight and where we can find you on social media and your podcast. All right, so three picks for you. Dominic Reyes at plus 105. Cub Swanson at plus 150. Dustin Jacoby at plus 105. The last three fights of the night tonight, all underdogs, uh, but all match up well against their opponents. So I got all three of those as well. You can find me on Twitter at Sports Stove. The Sports Stove Podcast can be found anywhere you get your podcast. We'll be having a lot of uh, draft coverage here coming out this weekend, uh, recapping everything going on. We've got some exciting interviews. Carson Williams from Western Kentucky, who just got signed by Vegas uh, Raiders, coming out of basketball, going into football. We've got him coming up here in the near future. His UFC picks are red hot on this show, and uh, he's breaking his arm, patting himself on the back for getting more NFL draft picks than ESPN. <laughs> he's our good friend, Vince Stover. Vince, thanks for joining us again, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Brad. Great show today. All right. Thank you, sir. That's Vince Stover with the Sports Stove Podcast. Coming up next, our nemesis, Dead Air Dennis of 96, 92.1 Classic Rock. He'll join us to give us derby picks coming up here on ESPN Radio 1300, 92.5. ESPN Radio 1300, 92.5. Glad you guys, I uh, hope you guys are Doobie Brothers fans because you just heard a little bit extra of that. ESPN Radio 1300, 92.5. It's the bottom line with Brad Taylor. Sports talk from a handicapping perspective brought to you by Stable Duel. Thanks so much for joining us on this uh, first Saturday in May, Derby Day, of course, as we know. Coming up later today on Hank 96.1, you can hear all the Derby coverage here on the radio. Uh, our good friend Sean C., the program director here at ESPN Radio, he will be uh, on the ones and twos of some sort, somehow. He has a lot to do with that, so uh, if you if you like it or don't like it, just call in Monday and complain to him about it. But no, he, he does a great job. I, th- I think he won some kind of Eclipse Award for it last time. Uh, so yeah, make sure to listen to the Derby. Hank, 96.1. And of course, this afternoon, 340 here on ESPN Radio, you can hear Game 2, Cubs and Reds at Great America Ballpark. Zach Davies for the Brewers and Luis Castillo. For the Reds, we have tried calling, we have efforted uh, calling our good friend Dead Air Dennis from uh, 92.1 Classic Rock. Probably had a long night out at uh, Jake's Cigar Bar or something, and uh, we couldn't get in touch with him. So we will have to have him on maybe at the Preakness. He will get, uh, he will, unless maybe we have him on the air right now. Maybe we have him going. Maybe we have a call into the station right now. Hello, you're on the air, Dead Air Dennis. Well, 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 here we are again, the radio. We just can't live without it, can we? Well, we, I can't live without it. Somebody had to just wake up in the middle of nowhere, because I've already tried to call you three <laughs> times, Dead Air Dennis. He must have a rough night spending all those weeks. Uh... <laughs> hey, somebody's going to spend.
spend that money. Yeah, exactly. With us on the phone, ladies and gentlemen, Dead Air Dennis Dillon of 92.1 Classic Rock. Heaven forbid we get him up before 10 o'clock in the morning around these parts. But now he's ready and raring to go. And we would love to have him here. Now, he blew us out on Stable Duel during the Keeneland Meek. And for that reason, he walks around here like he owns the place. All he does is brag and point and laugh at poor Brad Taylor around here. So, yes, you earned your, quote-unquote, earned your uh, position here as our uh, horse racing expert today. Give us your thoughts on the Derby this afternoon because I know a lot of people have their pen and their paper and they're wanting to know what Dead Air Dennis, who raked in tons of money from Stable Duel this spring, who do you like at the Derby, Dead Air Dennis? You know, I'm, I'm not going to go against the favorite, so I will be including the favorite in anything I do. So uh, Luis Saez and, and myself as well got jilted, I feel, uh, a couple of years ago when Maximum Security got... Uh, disqualified so i'm all over louis Saez. i've never seen a jockey fight and ride as hard as he does every race i don't care if it's a claimer or you know what the race is uh, that guy is always trying to win the race he just uh, it's almost like he's got a finish line in his head and he just gets there so so essential quality is uh, essential and uh, and you know it's bob baffert too bob baffert's going to be out there with uh, medina spirit and I just don't know how you cannot include Bob Baffert on, on a ticket. So those would be my top two favorites. So his top two favorites, ladies and gentlemen, and believe me when I tell you, I got sick at looking at this guy's name on the Stable Duel <laughs> Leaders chart. Believe me. He's taking number 14, Essential Quality, and number 8, Medina Spirit, who's sitting right now at 15-1, to 1, but he's got the magic man, Mr. Baffert, as his trainer. And that's what a lot of people... Now, is that something you look at in these Triple Crown races, Dennis? You're looking at Baffert because he's had so much success recently? Well, you know, you look at the pedigree when it comes to the horse. I think you can look at the pedigree when it comes to the trainers as well. You know, it's, that's the kind of industry we're talking about. And, um, you know, and these guys, they um, they spend a lot of money and a lot of time to get where they are. And, uh, and the ones that succeed are probably spending maybe a little bit more money and a little bit more time. You know, it's it's just like any sport, any athlete, really. So that's that's kind of how I approach it. Now, does that mean it's going to happen? I mean, you know, we're talking about animals, and, uh, you know, you just don't know what you're going to get, right? It's, that's um, true. That's, or else we'd all be <laughs> betting on horses every single day. It'd be easy money, exactly. <laughs> Now, oh, wait, you don't you do not do that already? Oh, well, we've been on other stuff. Maybe not horses as much. But, hey, 361 days a year, the other stuff, you got it, baby. I take four days off no matter what. But, hey, back in the 80s, back, I know you, you know were. What, it's, the, it's the any given Sunday of, uh, yes. of horse racing, right? I mean, you just don't know what the animal is going to wake up and feel like that day. Now, I know you're a chalk pusher, which means you like to take nothing but the favorites. But back in the 80s, when I was listening to you <laughs> on the radio, when you were spinning Def Leppard and Journey all day long, I would sit in the infield, and I'd have a couple pops, and I'd be looking at these fields. You remember the field? You got, they put like three or four horses in the field. You know, They gave you three or four for the price of one. Hey, and people like me, oh, right. look at this. I got, the, I got four horses here. I can't lose. Well, you always <laughs> lost. Give us a long shot here, Dennis Dillon, that may uh, come in and maybe get that show spot after you've already given us uh, 14 Essential Quality and number eight, Medina Spirit. Well, so Hot Rod Charlie is uh, seems like he's kind of going in the right direction. Um, I like I like how he looks, and uh, I like what I've heard about him. Um, Hot Rod Charlie know, is seven to one. That's not we're talking about you know big big numbers here now. <laughs> you you want the you want the one that's got, gonna make I need make one sure that's gonna I need one that's gonna pay for my dinner tonight. You know, but then some, yeah. <laughs> You uh, you you don't want to come in next Saturday, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be in the islands next week? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I got a yacht in the Pacific waiting for me. I'm not going to be doing this radio thing much longer. I hope you know that. I need some winners. Well, well let's. Look, well, how about helium then? Okay, let's, let's go to helium. You're just making what stuff if, up now. You're just looking for the biggest odds now. You're just giving me something. So the hot well, rod Charlie. Well, tell me, tell me why hot hot rod Charlie seven to one number nine horse. Uh, so Joel Rosario is on Hot Rod Charlie, okay. and um, and I forget what the uh, and you, you you got me while I'm driving here, and I forget the race that he uh, the couple races he comes out of, but he just looks like the improving kind, and you know when they're three years old, I mean, you know they're 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 no longer those babies, they're no longer the two year olds, and they've got uh, the experience, but they're still growing and they're still 
developing in, as, as, as animals and uh, and uh, muscular, you know, the, you know, they're still, yeah. their bodies are still growing. And, and he seems to be the kind that, you know, looks like he hasn't reached full potential yet. So, you know, I kind of like him. I like his rider, too. Yeah. <laughs> there are times when I don't like his rider, but, uh, I, but I do, you know, he, he's a good one. So let's summarize this. Dead Air Dennis Dillon of 92.1 Classic Rock, who blew us out during the Keeneland meet over at Stable Duel, likes uh, as his long shot, quote-unquote, he likes uh, the Louisiana Derby winner, Hot Rod Charlie, but his main two, number 14, Essential Quality, and number 8, Medina Spirit. Those are his big two exacta plays, if you want to put them in your exacta. Anything in parting, Dead Air Dennis, you want to get out about the Derby today or your show over on Classic Rock? Well, we're having a little party at the house today, so, you know, everybody's invited, so come on over. Um, that's uh, that's going to be like a day-long thing once I get out of the studio, um, and uh, and that's how we're going to play the day. We just like to get together and, and put a dollar bill in the middle of the room and uh, bet on the horse that's going to finish last in a race. So, you know, we <laughs> we find all ways, kinds of ways to lose money. Um but uh, but download the Keeneland Select app and uh, and have some fun today. That's uh, that's a great that's the app I use and uh, you know I highly recommend it and use me as a reference. <laughs> but Stable Duel, you know, I was invited uh, to play Stable Duel by uh, I believe you, Brad. So in the words of uh, uh, the great actor Daniel Day Lewis, I'm drinking your milkshake. You know, there's no need for cheap shots, okay, Dylan? That's, that's enough of that. <laughs> I have to put up with you enough as it is around here. I'm not in here very much, but the rare times I do see you, I have to hide my face. He's dead air, he's dead air Dennis Dillon. He's a great guy. We uh, we appreciate him very much. Essential quality of Medina Spirit, 14-8. That's your exact for today. Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it, buddy. May the winners be yours today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad, man. Anytime. All right, buddy. Thank you. See ya. That's dead air Dennis Dillon. We are running bad late. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to all our guests. And uh, as always, today at the Derby, may the winners be yours.